forward to what you are molding us into for the path that you have set before us truly let us forget what lies behind and look forward to what you have in store uh, for the the excellent and surpassing worth of knowing you and your resurrection the power that raised you from the dead may we look forward to the right things we thank you lord and we pray this in your name amen all right what's up guys um I've entitled the word, uh, No Confidence in the Flesh. Um, thanks for tuning in. Hope, hope you had a great week. Excited for the word. So let's go ahead and whoops, tune in here. Um, <clears throat> let me go ahead and read, it, or read, read us the passage. It's Philippians 3, 4 through 14. Even though I, too, have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone, if anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew born of Hebrews, as to the law of Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as a righteousness under the law, blameless. Yet whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as loss because of Christ. More than that, I regard everything as a loss because of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things. I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteous of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes from faith in Christ. The righteousness from God based on faith. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming uh, like him in his death, if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained this or have already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I have made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead. I press on toward the goal for the prize of the heavenly call of God in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> so I've organized this uh, word into four main points, so we'll just dive right in. Number one, Paul refutes those who add to the gospel, and he says, you know what, there's no confidence in the flesh. Um, we'll start with verse four. He says, even though I too have reason for confidence in the flesh, our passage from the lectionary this, past, this week um, kind of starts from a, uh, kind of an odd, awkward place, and so we'll scoot back a little bit. Um, the context, context is this, Paul is arguing against those who popped up among the church people, the early church, and these guys were teaching the early Christians um, to not just believe in Jesus, but to kind of add their own thing, you know, namely circumcision. And so Paul's refuting these false teachers, um, and you know what the thing that they were doing was very subtle. It could even be wrapped as like a desire to be righteous. Like you know, you know Jesus is enough, but you know get circumcised. And it was like trying to add a polish. Um, but if you think about Jesus, he's perfect. You don't need to add anything. And this subtlety is so dangerous that Paul calls them dogs, and and he means it with the fullness of the derogatory term that it is. Um, he wasn't trying to make friends with them. He wasn't trying to soften the blow. He wasn't even trying to, um, you know, censor himself. He's like these. He calls them evil workers, workers of evil, um, and it wasn't harsher an overreaction. Uh, basically, these false teachers. If you look behind the subtlety, they were trying to add pride and self righteousness into the hearts of these, you know, young Christians. That Jesus is not enough. That you have to uh, supplement it with your own accomplishments and your own efforts and this is completely antithetical to the gospel itself and Paul isn't going to have any of it 
In fact, uh, Galatians 1.8, I want to read us, it says this, Let God's curse, not so, just some man's curse, let God's curse fall on anyone, including us, or even an angel from heaven who preaches a different kind of good news than the one we preached to you. He's like, not even me and all that I've done, Paul, this is Paul talking to the church in Galatia, um, not even an angel who, you know, minister to God is going to be exempt from the curse of God if even slightly the, the gospel has changed. So zero tolerance policy. God's a God of love, patience, slowness to anger, steadfast love, all second chances, mercy. But in one place God does not mess around is the gospel. He's like, don't even touch it. Don't, don't change it. And uh, I think this is an important... Um, point to make because nowadays on TikTok you get everybody and their grandma's opinion on the gospel. There's a lot of health and wealth gospels. Uh, there's a lot of like um, you know mega churches popping up that that kind of tweaks the gospel. And you you think some people are just freaking out, but it's not. It's it's worth guarding and getting right. Think of it this way. Uh, I don't know if you guys have used Google Maps, but Every place on this earth has like GPS coordinates. And if you even change one number in there, you're not going to be in that place. Um, or another example, if you don't know, if you're not familiar, if you've ever had a bank account and you have direct deposit or, you know, let's say you file, everybody's filing their taxes right now and you want your tax return to come to you as a direct deposit. If your account number or your routing number is even off by one number, you're not getting your money. And so... Just that subtle, slight off is a big deal. The takeaway is this, that um, you know we really need to know the voice of God. How do you tell a counterfeit? It's not by going around and trying to identify every wrong thing about all the counterfeits. It's by knowing truly with all your heart the real deal. How they you know determine counterfeit dollars is they take the real one, they take the counterfeit, and they put it right next to each other. Instead of just looking at the counterfeit, trying to figure out what, what's all wrong with it, trying to find like, you know, where's Waldo? You know, they put it right up to the real one and it's a lot faster and more efficient. So we need to know the voice of our shepherd. The second point is this, Paul, <clears throat> how he is an example of that truly nothing else is needed apart from Christ. Um, I'm going to read 4b. If anyone else has reason to be confident in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the fifth day, a member of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Gen uh, Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to righteous son of the law, blameless. Whatever gains I had, these I have come to regard as lost because of Christ. Paul's like, bro, if there's anyone that should be you know, trying to rely on a little bit of what I can do or what I can bring to the table, it should be me. And he's not even trying to, you know, he's not even trying to brag. He's he's being, he's like literally giving his resume of his real life. He didn't exaggerate anything. He was literally um, like the most perfect Jew that you could find. Um, even his genealogy and his heritage, he was like, you know, grade A, you know, like, you know, dogs, they come with this like certificate of like pure breed. Like he was a pure breed um, Jew, like, he uses the term Hebrew of Hebrews. That was the Jewish equivalent of what we say goat. You know, LL Cool J um, kind of coined that term back in the early 90s or something like that. Um, but, you know, we say goat. They say Hebrew of Hebrews or something of something. And for us to really get an idea of the scale of what it means to be the best of best and not to be the best of the best, we're going to talk about somebody who was the worst of the best. And that guy's name is Brian Scalabrini. Um, and he got a lot of hate um, because, like, you know, statistically and even in his career, he was like one of the worst NBA players. Um, and for some reason, he got kind of well-known and notoriety because of that and a lot of hate on the internet and he got fed up with it he was like you know what i get it i didn't have the greatest career but i still played in the nba and i you know you know i battled with these nba level guys and so he's like all right if anybody he made a video he's like if anyone if, if anyone wants to come and play me one-on-one -on -one, and and keep in mind this is like years after he retired like he's not in like nba body form he's older but he's like still if anyone wants to come hoop with me, I will show you that y'all are tripping. And so people showed up and he made a video of it and he was hooping on all of them. Not one even came close to beating him. 
and this was him like not being in, in, in shape and being old. And he just proved to them that, you know, even though he was the the worst in the NBA, that was still like the elite top like 3% of humanity playing. And, and for the rest of us normals people, like we can't even compete. And so he put a lot of people in their place. And so to, to, if you if you consider that, Paul was like, bro, I wasn't even the worst. I was the best of the best, and I'm still not enough. So it's for you guys to listen to these Judaizers, these these fools out there, these dogs talking about how you need to add a little something, what you can do. He's like, you're actually tripping. You're you are so far from the truth. Like you cannot add anything. And Paul, you know, he lays it out. In fact, he goes a step ahead in First Timothy one fifteen. He says. This is a trustworthy saying, and everybody should accept it. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the worst or the foremost. Paul says, I am the worst sinner. Man, can you imagine? He's the best of the best. He's the cream of the crop. And yet, this is what happens when you come to Jesus. When you come to know God of this universe, you really realize how broken and unworthy and how sinful you are that is the impact that jesus the light of the gospel when it shines in the darkness of our hearts and illuminates us for who we are we realize how wretched we are and uh so the takeaway is for you know if if paul had nothing to have be confident in and of itself how much more should we be realizing that we have nothing we could add and simply rest upon jesus and on that day when we stand before God on that, you know, the Bema throne in front of the judgment throne, it, can you imagine trying to be like, oh God, you know, look at all this stuff that I did. It's not going to float. It's not going to happen. All we can do is rely on Jesus and Christ alone. Let us hold tightly to Jesus. Amen. Point number three. He says, compared to Jesus, all else is rubbish. So now the focus goes from Paul, you know, and then he's like the, the surpassing value of Jesus. He said, verse 8, more than that, I regard everything as lost because of the surpassing value of knowing Jesus Christ, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things, and I regard them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but one that comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness of God uh, based on faith. So not even the righteousness that comes from the law, but like a greater infinite righteousness of God himself. You know, it's like talking about a bootleg, you know, item from China versus the real thing, except times infinity. And really, Paul actually lost everything. Um, and we're not even just talking about the sacrifices he made to go on those mission trips and 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 the life that he lived. We're, let's 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 lose. Let's zoom in here. Paul actually lost everything. Like before he met Jesus, he was a Pharisee. He had a huge group of friends that you know his colleagues were fellow Pharisees. They loved him. They respected him so much. I can't imagine you know being the Hebrew Hebrews like how well respected and accepted he was in his crowd. And not to mention the people who probably like wow, Paul like Saul. You say something, you know, you say jump. We say you know yes sir. How high? Um, and and he went from that you know status, security, money fame, you know, reverence, knowledge, power, everything, uh, you know, degrees and everything down to he was a traitor and a looting. In fact, uh, he's a crazy man. In fact, the Jewish people who once loved him, the leaders were like, they took a vow, were like, we will not eat until we kill this man. Like, this is, this is happening. We're going to kill him. Can you imagine what it feels like? I think I can imagine a little bit having like lost all my friends, you know, to, when I first came back to church. I get a little glimpse of it. It must have been lonely, super lonely at first. But you know what? Paul says of what I lost is it's, it's nothing. We'll touch on that point in a second. But, you know, imagine like becoming a congressperson. You work your whole life to be elected into office and you get respected everywhere. You get power, this privilege, impact how the country runs. You make laws. You can, you know, declare war. You can do, you know, background checks on government officials and do all this stuff, you're financially secure, making like 200K a year, and you get you work for five years as a congressperson, you get like a lifelong pension. Like you're, you, you know, you, it's a cushy job. Imagine losing all that because you're Christian. Um, there's a, I've got a, an example. Um, there's this guy named Richard Gere. 
I don't know, probably most of you, you know, like Gen Z, like uh, post millennials probably don't even know. Um, but he was a famous actor, like in the 80s, in the early 90s, man, he was like, he was like Tom Cruise, except and him, him and Tom Cruise are probably like colleagues in the same, you know, age group. But in 93, like, I think it was like the, it was one of the big award shows. He pulled like a Will Smith, but it wasn't like a, a wacky thing like Will Smith did. Um, he actually publicly spoke out against China because he was all about like the Tibetan freedom. He was like, this is a crime against humanity. Like China, y'all need to, y'all need to stop tripping. You need to like let these people, you know, live. And because of that, he got blacklisted. Like China was like, oh, we hate this man. How dare he talk about us and try to call us out. And so Hollywood, they couldn't, you know, put him in any big films anymore because China is the second biggest market in all the world for Hollywood. And, you know, there's all, they're all about money. Um, and so they're like, we can't cast you anymore because, you know, it's our, half our market's not going to watch any of our movies. We can't make money. You're done. And so since 1993, when he spoke out publicly, he's not been in a single like top tier movie. He's been in like some like lower, like less, you know, famous movies, but basically his whole career went down the drain. Sad story. But, you know, it's like Paul, he lost everything, but he's like, I'm not even mad. Like, in fact, he calls it rubbish. The, Jew, the Jewish, the Greek word is excrement. Uh, not the Greek word, but that's the true meaning. And like, let's talk about excrement. Like, this is a strong word. Like, it's like S-H-I-T. Like, that's the word he used. He's like, compared to what I have in Jesus, everything else that I had is S-H-I-T. And man, like, taking my dogs on a walk, man, poop. Man, whenever they poop, I have to pick it up. And, you know, I have to feel the warmth of it. And sometimes it slides out of the bag in my hand and I can, you know, it's squishy. And then I smell it. And I almost throw up and I'm gagging and I get wet mouth. Man, poop. It's just, it's just gross. Like, you don't want to go near it. I remember, like, having a bag full of dog, warm dog poop swung around and hit my face. And it was, like, not a good experience. Um, whoever did it, man, <laughs> that was, that was, that was mean. Um... But like, can you, that, that's, that's, that's what poop is. And that's what Paul calls his prior accomplishments. All that the world has to offer really strong language. But how could he do that? How could he, how is it that he did that? Well, he knew Jesus. And so the Bible really teaches us to know Jesus and everything else will fade. I remember like recently my mom's dog passed away and she was, she was just heartbroken. I've never seen her that sad in a long time. I mean, she and my dad had been getting into some fights. I didn't even see her that sad, <laughs> even with that. Um, but I remember what I, there's a story my mom told, but she had chihuahuas before I was born. Um, but my mom said that when she was pregnant, she got rid of all, she gave them away. And that's super sad because I know how dog, now I know as a dog owner, if you give your dogs away, there's a pretty good chance that they're just gonna go to a kill shelter and get killed and like I can't even imagine my dogs getting killed right now or leaving them but from my mom she was like it, it I'm, sh I'm sure she had some second thoughts like of giving them away but I'm sure once she made that decision she didn't look back because she had a baby coming like she didn't want to be uh, she wanted to be to be committed she wanted not to have any distraction not be compromised in any way for the joy of having your first child having that baby and so, like, like it was incomparable. Like, she didn't even look back. But even though, like, to her, it was her babies before, you know, her, dog, her dogs. Like, my uncle, before his firstborn, he quit smoking cold turkey. Like, it's kind of unheard of. And so, that's really what it means. Like, once we have this knowledge and experience of Jesus' goodness, the things that used to kind of own our lives, they, they, they lose their power and that is what Jesus does. So our focus should not be like, oh my God, this is bad, this is bad, this is bad. It is good to know that, but rather than obsess over that, we should be obsessing over Jesus. That is what gives us the power to break the chains. Amen. Um, the last point I want to make is this. We are not called to earn Jesus, but to know and follow him. Um, I'm going to read that last section, verse 10. I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the sharing of his sufferings by becoming like him in his death. 
if somehow I may attain the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already attained this or already reached the goal, but I press on to make it my own, because Christ Jesus has made me his own. Beloved, I do not consider that I made it my own, but this one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal of the prize of the heavenly God, call of God in Christ Jesus. And I love how he says, man, I want to make it my own. I want to make it my own. Um, really, like, it's talking about experiential love, that experience of Jesus. I read a really cool quote this week. It said this, um, don't let successes get to your head, then don't let failures get to your heart. Um, Paul really is talking about letting go, forgetting what's behind, and moving towards what's ahead. The promises of God, the call of heaven, the path that God is putting us on. And, uh, you know, Paul doesn't call his, uh, let me make sure my battery's good. All right, Paul doesn't call his past accomplishments rubbish because they're bad. It's not like a college degree or, you know, God doesn't call like being successful at our jobs or, you know, being good at something as bad. They're not inherently bad. But if any of these things should take us away from the value of Christ, then, you know, something's not right here. And in, in comparison to knowing Jesus, all those things just fail to compare so it's not like we should throw everything away and just like be crazy. Uh, we should be crazy for Jesus, uh, but we need to put them in their place. Um, <clears throat> you know, and uh, it, it, this is something that hit me this week. Like Paul, when he was uh, when he was on his way to Damascus and he encountered Jesus uh, face to face, uh, you know, the Bible says that he became blind. Um, which is ironic because he saw Jesus and then he became blind. Maybe it was like a symbolic for how blind he really was. And then after he gets prayed for and he chills, his, uh, chills in this buddy's house uh, on Straight Street, right? Um, it says right before he got this guy prayed for him and, his, and right before his eyes opened, something like scales fell from his eyes. I'm like, what is up with these scales? Like kind of gross too, if you, if you think about it. But, you know, like, what are, what are, what is an animal that has scales? There are a couple of animals, but generally it's fish. Fish have scales. And it's crazy. When you scale fish, it looks the same. It's like a clear scale. And, and the reason why fish have scales is because it's protection and it's, it gives them the ability and, and the slime to, to fly around in the water. And, but, but most of all, like, it's harder to kill. Like, if someone tries to bite them, like, you, they can get away. Um, so it's like an armor, a protection. And so it's, in a sense, like, Paul losing these scales is, is what Paul's talking about in this passage. He's like, he lost everything, all his, all his security, his, his status, his power, his privilege, his money, the love of people. All these, you know, frail and temporary things got taken away from him. But what he earned was was Jesus. Although he took up the cross and the and it says that we that we should know Christ in his sufferings, the power of his resurrection. How are we going to know the power of Christ's resurrection if we don't know what it feels like to be killed all the day long to borrow from Paul's words. And so the more that we draw near to him, the more we experience him, the more we appreciate him and you know, apology, the part of the, the knowledge of, the, of Christ is not only the good, but also we're going to go through some hard times. We're going to go through some loneliness, some, some low times, some rejection, some, um, you know, X, Y, Z. From, the, you know, from, from following the way the Bible wants us to live, we're going to experience some loss. But the more we get to know Jesus in all of that experience, we're going to um, realize how good he is. And be that much more in depth and be more intimate in knowing him. And so that's what we're called to do. To really, as the Bible says right in our passage, uh, to make it my own. It's not like somebody else's faith. Like I know what, you know, that firsthand experience of what Jesus is like. Like, can, you know, there is a, it's an infinite difference between someone else, you know, experiencing some cool thing versus you going and experiencing, let alone experiencing Christ. So that's what he's talking about. I'm going to make it my own. Not that I'm already there, but that's that process, that heavenly call of what lies ahead. So brothers and sisters, beloved, I hope that this uh, encourages you 
to, to see the things of this world for what they are by experiencing Christ and to take a hold of what Christ is taking a hold of you for and really running hard for the goal. So don't give up. Let's continue to let's continue to run. And now let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, God. May these words ring true in our lives. And Lord, it's a simple prayer. That is what we want, Father. We thank you. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right, guys. Hope you have a wonderful week. I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye.